All right, here we go. Oh, I have no idea. Because it hates me. Why is it yellow? Oh, that's why. Got it. Solved it. All right, perfect. All right, so here we go. As you can see, we have a chart for the first time ever. So I'm going to go through it with you. Here we go. So Industrial Revolution, America's primary source, the Irish cotton and linen industries before and after English tariffs, 1800 to 1840. What do we know? Maya? Um, a it's a government restriction on trade. And how does that usually come about? Increase what? Taxes. Increase tax. Good. All right, what else do we know? What else do we know? Is this good for who? This is good for Britain. This is bad for who? Ireland. Ireland. Okay. Cotton and linen industries, that's all your textiles. Okay, when you are looking at a chart of some sort, you need to actually really make sure you understand what the chart is telling you. If you don't go through the, even just the title, which is what we have, and go through and look at it closely, make sure you understand, then this is going to be a problem. Okay, so town, Dublin, Master Woolen Manufacturers, 1800, 91, employed, 1840, 12. Is this up or down? Increase or decrease? Hands employed, 1800. 4,918, 1840, 602. Increase or decrease? Master Woolcombers, 800, 1800, uh, 30, 1834, 5. Increase, decrease? Uh, hands employee, 1800, 230, 1834, 63. Increase, decrease? Carpet manufacturers, 1800, 13, 1841, 1. Increase, decrease? Hands employ 1800, 720, 1841, none. Increase, decrease. Silk loom weavers, 1800, 2500, 1840, 250. Increase, decrease. Ca um, sure, wherever this is. Calico looms at work, 1799, 2500, 1841, 226. Increase, decrease. Hand looms at work, 1800, 1000, 1841, none. Increase, decrease. Braid weavers, 1800, 1000, 1834, 40. Increase, decrease. Worsted weavers, 1800, 2000, 1834, 9, 90. Increase, decrease. Hoosiers, 1800, 300, 1834, 28. Increase, decrease. Wool combers, 1800, 700, 1834, 110. Increase, decrease. Con weavers, 1800, 2000, 1834, 220. Increase, decrease. Linen cheek weavers, 1800, 600, 1834, none. Increase, decrease. Uh, con spinners, bleachers, 1800, thousands, 1834, none. Increase, decrease. Okay, so once you finish a chart, it's important that you just stop real quick and just summarize what you just did. Read, what, what did we just uncover? Uh, the types of employees that they have. After machines? What are you talking about? Like, when they got, like, old machinery. Mm, be careful. You're making a lot of assumptions. Read, 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 read the title of the document. Oh, after the tariffs? There you go. After tariffs? After the tariffs, what, Read. They lost a lot of employees. Lost a lot of jobs. Okay, so quick summary. Then we're going to complete the happy H A P P Y. All right, what's the historical context? What's the historical context, Lily? Um, the <coughs> mm, that's the historical context. What is going on in the world? The Industrial Revolution. is in full swing. Okay, who's the audience of this piece? Okay, all this data is collected for who, uh, Max? Why the hell would the English care about Irish workers? 
No, you don't understand what a tariff is. What is a tariff? Okay. So, uh, in case you haven't been listening to Donald Trump, Donald Trump, since uh, his campaigning, he was talking about if a company moves out of the country, he was going to charge them an increase in a lot of money, right? Hello? So, if you make refrigerators and you move your factory to Mexico to save money, then you want to turn around and send those, uh, send those refrigerators back to the United States. Trump wants to put a huge tariff on it. So if the fridge, now that the plants in Mexico only cost $500, Donald Trump is suggesting that we charge a huge tariff. So instead of paying $500 for the fridge because of all the increase of taxes on the, because of the tariffs, it's going to cost about $850. If you're paying an additional $250 just in taxes because of this tariff, are you going to pay that increase? Or are you going to find a cheaper fridge built here in the United States? Hello? You're going to find a cheaper fridge that's built here in the United States. That's the point of a tariff. Is it good for the home country or the external countries? Home country is where it benefits. Okay? So, who is this for the Irish cotton and linen industries before and after English tariffs 1800 to 1840 who made this document Vanessa the Irish made it the Irish made it for who who why are they making this who is it for Dean Irish government Okay, what is the purpose of this piece? What is the purpose of this piece, Jessica? Um, to show that after tariffs, the went down. Okay. Uh, English tariffs have destroyed Ireland's textile business. Okay, what now when we talk about point of view, obviously this isn't a person, it's a data set, correct? What is the significance of this document? What is it really showing us? Yes, it shows us Ireland after the tariffs, but what is it really showing us? What is it showing us, Sophia? How about Vanessa? No, it has nothing to do with machines. What do we got? Um, the English monopolizing like the textile industry by eliminating competition. Okay, English are eliminating. Nice job, Jack. Are eliminating textile competition. Okay, why is this significant? Why are we reading about this in 2017, Max? I'm sure that not everybody is benefiting as great Okay, not everyone benefits. From the Industrial Revolution, from the Industrial Revolution. Okay. But what else? Why is not everyone benefiting? What is happening here? What is this document showing us, Alexandra? Don't show me tar Don't tell me tariffs. Okay. Well, the English had more power, so the like, countries with more power benefited more. Okay, I like that. Um, however, there's a whole component here. Why do they have more power, Alexandra? What type of power do they have? What type of power? Is it military power? What type of power do they have? Economic. Yes! Alright, so not everyone benefits from the Industrial Revolution because of economic warfare. The most powerful countries have 
have the most power. There we go. And the idea of in, uh, economic warfare is an industrial idea. All right, flip it over. You have four minutes to go through. It's just a regular document. Keep in mind, a lot of you lost points last week because you did not mark up the document. Go through, mark it up. You have four minutes. Go. You have two minutes. Absolutely start your happy, people. If you're done, I would start your happy. You'll have time to work on it after your four minutes. But if you are all the way through, I'd start working on it. There's no point not. One minute.
Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. All right, turn to someone next to you. You've got two minutes. Make it next to you. You don't need to go anywhere. Here, Aiden, will you work with Reed? Micah, can you work with Adrian? One minute. <laughs> <laughs> Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, you are going to pass Jessica, your primary. I'm grading them. Here we go. Jessica is collecting your primary. Jack is collecting your map. Pass them now. Time is up. Let's go. Jessica is collecting your primary. Jack is collecting your map. Jessica and Jack, you do not need to put them in order. Just put them in a pile. Let's go. You should be helping sort. Everyone should be passing. If you haven't finished, time's up, man. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Everyone needs to have their notebook out. We're transitioning real quick. All right. Who can raise their hand and tell me where we left off? Who can raise their hand and tell me where we left off? Lily. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, so contraception is a big deal. It's a big deal for multiple reasons. First of all, it's going to be a huge foundation of the women's rights movement, which is really going to push through during the industrial age. We're also going to see um, it's going to become a social priority. It's not just a woman's priority. It's going to be a social priority because of Malthus. Now, Malthus is going to believe that the Earth's population is going to become too big, and because it's going to be too big, everyone's going to die. Does this prediction come, come about? No, it does not. He does not um, equate for a couple of things. However, um, it does scare a lot of people, which is a good thing. Okay, to be more focused. So condoms are, in, are created in order to allow women to work. Women are working. The idea of having a housewife is only for the incredibly wealthy, which it's always been that way, and it becomes in the 1950s. 
The idea of women working is incredibly common, and uh, what we're going to see is going to become incredibly dependent for the American household and British household. All right, so the urban environment. Keep in mind, are our cities ready for all these people to be moving in? No, no, they're not. That's why we have a thing called the slums. Okay, the cities are not ready. There's a ton of pollution. There's a ton of danger. There's a lot of things going on. So, would you want to live in an overcrowded, dirty, dirty city that doesn't even have sanitation? No. no. England is going to be the dirtiest city in the world for a while because of the first to industrialize. Okay. So, a lot of people in England are going to want to leave because it's dirty and disgusting. The other major reason in England, you can't get anywhere because of your title or lack thereof. So, there is social classes that are very, very fixed. Where are they going to come? America. They're going to come to America because we do not have that rigid social class system. We are going to be in a country of immigrants, which means if you have the skills to succeed, you will. Um, and we're going to see um, a lot of that movement. So, we have transcontinental migrations. People from Europe are going to be making huge moves to America. The reason is, is there's a lot more opportunity here. Um, about five, uh, 50 million are going to cross the Atlantic. All of us are immigrants of some sort, unless you're 100% Native American, which I don't think any of you are. Um, if, with that being said, all of your parents, your grand, your great great grandparents that came here, are pretty much coming during the industrial age. My parents came over. Uh, my um, my family's descendants came over in the late, uh, my parent, my family was here during the American Revolution. Okay, so my family's been here pre-industrial age. Most people's families are getting here during the industrial age. Okay, so if you track back. Um, a lot of the British are coming here. The U.S. is a favorite destination because we have democracy, which makes people interested in this whole process, as well as the equal opportunity to rise. If you have a good idea, you'll be fine. All right, so there's a lot more new social class. We have a middle class for the first time. We also eradicate slavery. What year is slavery abolished around the world? You can raise your hand and tell me. It's a great year. Oh, didn't we not get here? That's fine. 1888. That is a year you should know. It's a huge marker. 1888 is the last year uh, slavery is completely abolished around the world. What is the last country to give it up? 1988? No. Brazil. Why is Brazil the last country to give it up, maybe? Um, it's literally like a coffee plantation. Absolutely. The coffee, but mostly a sugar plantation, which is way, um, a lot more, uh, physically exhausting, yes. Say 1988. 88. Oh my god, 1988. Probably like 1888. No, 1888. So it's a nice, pretty year. It's easier to remember. 1888 is the last year of slavery. Brazil is the last country to give it up. When does the United States give up slavery? Who can tell me? Is it 1862? No. Max? 1865. 1865. One of the great things about America is that we really dedicate ourselves for four years. Okay? The American Civil War started in 1861, goes to 18... Okay? The uh, World War I starts in 1917. And go uh, 1914 and goes to 1918. Okay, World War II is four and a half years, almost five. But that's fine. That's only American involvement. It's really six, but that's fine. When in doubt, a year always lasts for four. Does that make sense? So if you're ever trying to figure it out, always go for four. It's a nice kind of right number. You'll always be pretty damn close. Is that fair? So, all right. Uh, new social classes. We're also going to have this whole idea of sports. Okay, we have a lot of people in these cities, and when they're not working, they're causing trouble. So we have to organize events for them to keep them out of trouble. Baseball is going to be one of those things. Now, baseball is going to be incredibly popular. However, there's two major issues. Prohibition is going to cause a huge problem for American baseball because how people got, how baseball teams got people in the stands, they give away free beer. Okay, with prohibition, obviously there's no free beer, so that was a big deal. Also, baseball games can only be played during the middle of the day. Can you have that many people at a baseball game in the middle of the day? 
No, because a lot of people had to be at work, so that's a big issue that we're going to have to deal with, but yes. We also have the term of white collar, blue collar. Who can explain to me the difference between a white collar job and a blue collar job? What do you think? Cheyenne? White collar jobs are kind of like working in an office. Or Perfect. And blue collar jobs are more like factory or hands on. Excellent. That term, that exchange, is going to start popping up during the Industrial Revolution. You have some women who are going to be working in factories, some men who, uh, women and men are going to be working in factories, those are blue collar jobs. You'll also have some people working in offices for the first time, and that's going to be white collar jobs, and that's going to start coming up. All right, women at home. It is important that you understand that the agricultural and the cottage industries, women were the ones doing that. In their free time, they would make extra thread, make ribbons, do all those things to sell. It was an easy transition from women in these cottage industries to women in this factory system. So women were working the moment the first factory opened. You need to understand that it wasn't until the 1950s that idealized women stay at home is going to occur. This is going to really start in the 1800s. 1802, we have a huge factory boom in West London. Okay? Yes. Why do you think that one is so late? Because um, for about, at this point, it's been about 100 years of women working. You have to understand that throughout all of society, if all women are working, then the women who can stay at home are the perfect ones. Just like skin color, okay? Um, for instance, during the Middle Ages, if you were pale skin, you were beautiful. Because everyone else had to work. Had to do what? Work. work outside, absolutely, in the sun. So if you had dark skin, that means you worked. That means you had tan because you're in the sun, you're doing manual labor. If you had fair white skin like this right here, this pasty, this looks like I've never seen the sunlight in the, my entire life. If you have this color, it makes it look like you live a life of luxury. So because it's the opposite. Now here in 2017, having beautifully tanned skin is ideal, correct? Because are most people sitting outside lying around? No, most people are working and doing all these other things. So the idealized is the opposite. Same type of thing that's happening here. If most women are working, then the idealized woman is a woman who can stay at home and be the mother. However, is that what's really going to happen? No. no, absolutely not. Women are working. Now, the thing that really, really stinks about being a woman, even now to this day, I will say I feel pressure to do this, is that we go to work all day, then we have to come home and take care of our husband, because we've got to take care of our man, and take care of our children. So when women come home, and this is a huge issue during the Industrial Revolution. Now, my cray takes very good care of me, so don't feel that bad for me. But I do feel, you know, kind of guilty. Like today I'm going to yoga, so I'm not getting home till like 6.30. And so my cray will have dinner for me when I get home. But I feel kind of bad, like I'm a bad buddy, you know what I mean? Don't. I don't, because I'm still going, but that's fine. Um, but back then, men would absolutely not help with the cooking and the cleaning. That was women's work, not men's work. Even though women are leaving the house to go work, then they have to come home and be the perfect little housewife. Keep the house clean, play with the kids, clean up after the kids. So women are doing double duty. Do you think that frustration is going to cause a lot of issues? Women's rights movement, that's where that's going to come in, that frustration, that boiling up. The contraceptions are going to give them control of themselves. Then that frustration of having to do the double duty, okay, and having men not have to take any responsibility. They get to come home, you get to give them a beer, and he sits on the couch while you're doing the cooking, the cleaning, and, ten and tending to the children. Like, that's a lot of work. That's going to lead to a lot of frustration. Uh, women are going to also uh, expect it to work until marriage, domestic service. With marriage, some most are going to have to continue. Related, child labor is also going to happen. Now, child labor is going to happen because it's easy to exploit. Okay? You're also going to have um, some moral opposing to it. In the 1840s, the British start doing it. It's important that you understand that when the British start something, everyone else in the world is doing it during this time. Okay? Which is why here in America, when people look towards us now, what is America doing? Because the, what we do has an impact on the rest of the world. Does that make sense? Back then, it's England. England abolished slavery first. Guess what had happened? Within, within 80 years, everyone abolished slavery. What England does, everyone else does. So England started with child labor laws. Okay? You can only work, I think the first one they implemented, because in honors, you have to know them. And um, in 18... 
41, I think the first one, you couldn't work under the age of six. But those mature seven-year-olds, let's get them to work here, people. Okay, so it's kind of funny like that. As it gets older, eventually it will become a moral issue. Um, educated workforce. Now, it is important that you understand that you are not being educated right now for free on the U.S. government's dollars for your own benefit. The U.S. government does not actually care what you know and what you don't know for your own personal gain. It's not about you. The reason why you're being educated at the cost of the U.S. government is so you're not a moron. Because if you're a moron, you cost the government a lot more money. If you are too stupid to work, you can't read, you can't write, and you can't do basic math, who's going to have to take care of you? The government. Okay, whether you're going to be in our prisons or whether you're going to have to be on support from the government, you're not going to be able to function. So, in order to help eradicate government dependence or having a bunch of people who can't work because they're useless, what have they done? Free public education. You're being educated so you can get a job. You're not being educated so you can open your mind and experience Shakespeare and have a great appreciation find works of art, read literature, you know, seeing fantastic teaching happening on a daily basis in any world. You're not here for that. You're here so you can get a job. And that's where free public education is going to come from. Okay, so socialism. Socialism is going to come out of the fact of people are in tough situations. There's not a lot of money. They're spending about 14 hours a day working, and you're living in slums. Okay? Makes sense that people would get frustrated, correct? It makes sense that people would love the idea that everyone gets paid equally, and there's no such thing as owners. Everyone's the same. So if you go to work every day, you get the same amount of money as the foreman, or you know, the same amount of money as the secretary. Everyone gets paid the same. It's a beautiful idea. Can we agree? But no one has control over things. Okay? It absolutely opposes a capitalistic system or the market system. Okay? And it's going to attempt to create small models of it. Is it successful? No, especially under Fourier and Robert Owen. So this is a name you need to know. You need to write down Karl Marx. You need to write down the title of his book, which is The Communist Manifesto. Okay. He, you need to write down the two terms, capitalist and proletariat. So Karl Marx is the name of the author of the Communist Manifesto, he coined the terms capitalist, proletariat, now he made it famous, people mentioned it before, but he made it famous. The capitalists are your factory owners, the proletariat are the factory workers. Now Karl Marx believed with every fiber of his being that the proletariat, the factory workers, would overthrow the factory owners in a bloody revolution. That the factory workers would take over the factories Butcher, that's me stabbing, capitalist, okay? Then equally distribute the wealth of the factory to all of its workers and create this whole new utopian society, okay? Does it happen? Okay, that's a false because it was instigated, not done naturally by the people. He believed the people would naturally do it. Now the Russians love they are going to use him as the foundation of the Russian Revolution. However, the Russian Revolution is not going to follow it perfectly. Okay? Now, Karl Marx believed that this would naturally occur. And it probably would have naturally occurred. However, it does not occur. And you should write this down. This does not occur because of labor unions and labor laws. Okay? Karl Marx did not take into consideration that at some point the government and the workers would work together to improve the situation. He believed people were so financially driven that nothing would ever change it. So he is in wrong. It doesn't happen naturally because of labor laws and unions. Okay? We're going to get to that. So you need to know Karl Marx, you need to know the Communist Manifesto, you need to know that the proletariat were supposed to overthrow the capitalists and create a new utopian society. It's a big deal, and it's kind of a life thing. 
Like, you need to know who Karl Marx is because it will come up. What? What did Frederick Engels get, like, to that end? Ah, uh, because he, he wasn't hardcore. Karl Marx was just a lunatic. But, like, a really intelligent lunatic who just believed the worst in all people, and he was so extreme that he was like terrifying yet incredibly motivating. So he's like Karl Marx. And then Frederick Engels, he was a guy kind of doing the math. You know, trying to come up with like, this would happen because of this, this, and this. He's kind of the back end of it, and he was kind of like a blah personality. So when people think of the Communist Manifesto, you think Karl Marx. Um, Engels, he was a part of it, but he was kind of like, he was like, yeah, I mean, he's just kind of the quiet guy in the back. Does that make sense? Okay. So, social reform and trade unions. Karl Marx's revolution never occurs. Now, they try forcing it, which is going to be the Russian Revolution. Um, but that is done by personal entities for their own reasons, not the people. Even though they say they're the people. You forgot to <sighs> We'll get to Russia. We'll get there. All right, so socialism had a major impact. First of all, because of socialism, okay, we have medical insurance, we have unemployment compensation, and we also have retirement benefits. So because of all the things, because of socialism, this whole idea of taking care of each other, we have these great things. Is this an improvement to us, normal working people? Absolutely. I couldn't imagine our life without medical insurance, unemployment compensation, and retirement benefits. All of these things are brought about by socialism. Uh, trade unions form for collective bargaining. What is collective bargaining? What is collective bargaining? Aiden? To a degree. Okay, so I am a teacher here in Hillsborough County. Is that surprising to you? I know. It's shocking. Um, so here in Hillsborough County, we have a collective bargaining agreement. All 15,000 teachers hired by Hillsborough County are represented by six lawyers. These six lawyers, every year, go in front of the Board of Education of Hillsborough County, and they negotiate our contract. Okay? So, um, in the last forever I've been in Hillsborough County, we've been getting 2 to 3% increase every year um, for uh, basic bump and pay. Okay? What happens is those six lawyers go up to the Board of Education and they say, our teachers need a bump of pay of 2 to 3% for at cost of living expense. And the Board of Education probably says no. Then they say, well, we as a Board of Education need this from the teachers, and they sit there and negotiate. Now this year, negotiations went for eight months. He was on the brink of chaos, um, the negotiations this year. But at the end of the day, those six lawyers got a bunch of stuff for us teachers. I didn't have to go and sit in front of the Board of Education and say, hi, my name's Smith, and I teach at HB Plan. Um, I would like the pay increase of 23%, please. And the Board of Education, if it was just me standing there representing myself, what the hell would they say to me? No. Hell no! However, if I have 15,000 teachers behind me, standing in behind six lawyers, does that make us, our voices a lot louder? Absolutely. So that is what a collective bargaining agreement. You're going to hear collective bargaining agreements in the NBA, NFL, baseball, all of those things. They, all those athletes are on it, yes. It's kind of ridiculous how low teachers are paying. Like you'd think they'd be like the top priority for education since you know America wants to educate us not stupid but no yeah no our lottery tickets no I am like, way I am really cheap labor so why would they <laughs> want to mess it up so you know it is what it is I didn't get into teaching for the money I married for money <laughs> well yeah you can't get into teaching for money <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding I didn't marry for money All right, global effects. So the global division of labor, you're going to have rural societies and you're going to have urban societies. The whole idea, you either live in the city or you live in the sticks, comes about because of the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's an uneven economic development. When you look around the world, is every country as industrialized as the United States? No, absolutely not. A lot of countries aren't. A lot of countries are. And that whole, is, that is whole disparity is going to start popping up because of the Industrial Revolution. Um, developing export dependencies of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and all that stuff. 
The only continent in the world that's not industrialized, don't even say Antarctica to me, okay, please. There's like 10 people who live there all year, so don't even start that around. What continent is unindustrialized? Isabel? Africa. Africa. The reason why Africa is not industrialized is because of export dependencies. What that means is, okay, so for instance, in three weeks we have the Super Bowl. Next weekend we'll figure out who's in it. Um, okay, so whoever loses, okay, that Super Bowl, where are they going to send those t-shirts? Because when, after the Super Bowl, when all the confetti is falling down, I right, see the team that wins, got a bunch of cash, got a bunch of t-shirts on, okay, well, did, the, did they know who was going to win? Yeah, so guess what they have? Two. Every once in a while, you, find, you see people on like uh, social media after the game who's winning the other, wearing the other team's like Super Bowl shirt. One of my friends up in Massachusetts. So um, in 1996, New England, uh, the Patriots and Green Bay went against each other, and the Patriots won. Um, but one of my uh, one of my dad's friends was like a diehard Green Bay Packers fan, and he had a Super Bowl 1996 Green Bay Packers T-shirt. That he got like four or five years later, and it's like his prized possession. And that's so bad. He's the Cowboys. He's I know what a he's breaker. A, he's what a heartbreaker. Breaking. I know, and I hate. Him. Yeah. Um, so what's going to happen is, is that all those T-shirts of whoever loses the Super Bowl is going to be dropped off in Africa. When you go to Goodwill and you drop off a bunch of stuff, which don't go to Goodwill. If you're going to drop off clothes, bring it to Salvation Army. Goodwill sells your stuff for profit. So the guy who owns Goodwill made over $400 million last year yeah, off of you, and they do terrible things. Not do terrible things, but Salvation Army, 100% of the profits go back into their whole thing. Like, it's really good. Symbol. Anyway, off that so far. Okay, so Goodwill, after trying to sell all the crap that you don't want, that no one else wants, they take and they drop off all that clothes into essentially what we call third world nations. Uh, Dominican Republic, they send them to Haiti, um, and they send them to Africa. So if they're dropping huge masses of clothes and other trinkets and crap into these countries, do you think they have a local clothier, local textile industry? No, because they're getting free stuff anyway. Shoes, those stupid Tom shoes, these are fake Toms. Fake. Those Tom shoes have eradicated any businesses in Africa for a shoe creation. Why? So they get free shoes. Why is someone going to pay for them, correct? So no one's able to actually start their own shoes and stuff like that. So because of their dependence, do they need to industrialize? A perfect example of this is that guy who owns Caterpillar, you know the construction company? Cat, the yeah. big things, the dump trucks and stuff? Well, in 2006, he went to Africa, I think he went to the Sudan, and he brought over two dump trucks and three backhoes, which is like the claw thing. Yeah, so he brought it over there, and he went over there for about a month and trained everyone how to work the machine and stuff like that so they can build up infrastructure in their town or city or wherever it was. Um, so he leaves after about a month, and then about two months later, the machines break down. Does anyone there know how to fix it? Now, not only do they know how to fix it, do they have the supplies there to fix it? Because they didn't build... Caterpillar's factories are not in Africa. So is there any way to get a lot of those um, the components, all of the electrical stuff in Africa? No, you have to go and deliver. So for about 10 years now, there was a big piece about it a couple months ago, uh, a couple months ago and I remember hearing about it then, um, that all of that Caterpillar stuff has been laying still for about 10 years. Because they can't do anything with it because they don't have all that basic components to do it. That is a perfect example of an export dependent. Because we just keep giving stuff and we force them to depend on us, do we make a lot of money off Africa? No. We do make, we used to. We used to make a good amount with all the resources and stuff like that. And we'd steal their resources and give them crap. So have they had to industrialize in order to support themselves, in order to get the things they wanted? One of the big motivators for industrializing is weapons. What are they getting plenty of? They're getting plenty of weapons from the slave trade, remember? They have all of that stuff. They also have a couple other things once the slave trade ends in 1898. 
Okay, so that's a complete perfect example of an export dependent. So when you look at Africa and you're like, oh my god, Africa is such a mess, why can't they figure it out? It's the West that did this, not the Africans. All right, there we go, the Americas, here we go. So in case you're not sad now, it's only going to get worse. Okay, so uh, westward expansion. So Britain is going to give up everything west of the Appalachian Mountains. Napoleon is going to sell the Louisiana Purchase. Who is the name? Who is the president during the purchase? Who is the president, Dean? Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Everyone wasn't sure if it was within his rights as president to do it. He said, "Screw it, I'm doing it," and he did it. Then he sent Lewis and Clark out there, and who did they find? Sacagawea, and Sacagawea took them on a big tour. When they came back, they wrote their book. They presented it to Thomas Jefferson and the folklore of their trip, all the incredible things they saw, the animals, the large scale, all these things is going to attract people to go westward. Okay? So, manifest destiny is the belief that we had the right and the responsibility to expand. The right and the responsibility to expand. If we believe we had God-given right to go west, are we going to allow any native to slow us down? Hello? No, no. no and that's where we're going to start seeing a ton of conflict out west. Okay, so soon as manifest destiny starts, conflicts are rising. There's already conflicts already, obviously the French and Indian War um, and all that stuff. So the native people begin to have incursions and they're going to start fighting back. Um, they're going to form alliances amongst themselves and they're also going to uh, so seek out British support in Canada in order to help gain some support. So in the 1830s we're going to have the U.S. Indian Removal Act. Who is the president behind this? He's on your $20 bill, ladies and gentlemen. Who is it, Jack? Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson. Have a good day. <laughs>